Amen. My message today is called Close Proximity. And it's kind of an interesting title for a message, but I was thinking about, uh, it, it'll make sense here as we get into the, the meat of everything. I, I could not shake this week thinking about this concept or this, this, uh, this, this topic of people that we can read about in the Bible who were not the main character of the story, but who were the supporting cast, the people who were in close proximity to the main person. And the Lord put a specific person on my mind this week uh, in scripture, and we're gonna spend majority of the day talking about this character. But before we dive into that story, I wanted to kind of set the stage and kind of prepare your, your, your minds for everything that we're gonna be discussing. In thinking about these people who are in close proximity to these men and, and women that we read about in scripture who changed you know, the course of history or who really w was moved by or, or was used by the Lord in some capacity to be able to bring about change in the nation or for a person, the people that you examine, there are good examples that we can read of, of, of people who were uh, in close proximity to the main person who ended up, because they were so close, it ended up radically changing their life. You know, I think of like the disciples for Jesus. They were in such close proximity to what Christ was doing that it did change their life, right? There, were, there was a proximity that they were privy to that drastically impacted the course of their living. And then there were people who witnessed and who were also in close proximity to Jesus or to other people that we could read about in scripture who it did not impact their life and or it might have briefly impacted their life, but it did not result in an ultimate change in their living. And it, it was an interesting thing that God highlighted that this week. And I, I didn't fully understand why, but my message goes hand in hand with, uh, with what you were praying about uh, before I got up here, just about what we wanna do at the very end of the sermon and, and, and really pray for God to move in the miraculous and to, uh, really see healings and miracles take place here in this church for our community, this message is going to fit perfectly with that. And I just, I love that. I love when God does that. There's a false belief that we operate in, in the world, and that we hear a lot, and that's this. I need to see it to believe it. I need to see it to believe it. How many of you have heard that? How many of you have thought that or prayed that? To be honest, I need to see it to believe it. And sometimes we say this phrase in trivial matters, not pertaining to God. Maybe it's uh, to your spouse saying for the 100th time that they're going to pick up their clothes from the floor. And then you say the infamous phrase, oh, I need to see it to believe it. Okay. And that, but, but at its core, when we take that belief or that, that, that statement, that framework, and when we apply it to God, it, it, it can be very dangerous. Now, there are times, obviously, that we read about in Scripture where men and women of faith prayed to God for a sign, and God did respond. But it's different when men and women pray to God or or attempt to beckon God to move in an attempt to believe as the result, as opposed to believing first, and that's the thing that steered their prayer. Does that make sense? So I need to see it to believe it. This is, this is I mean, uh, it's not new to humanity to say this in their belief system or their attitude toward God, but it's very prevalent nowadays, right? It's not new, but it is prevalent. I need to see it in order to believe it. I need to see it, well, prove it to me, prove it to me. 
And when you think about it, the people, when we're talking about proximity, kind of going back to the first part, the first idea I was introducing, people who were in close proximity to these main characters in scripture, they were given and granted this access, if you will, to being able to see it in order to hopefully believe it. But it didn't always shake up that way. And I, I want, I say, I, I start out with all of this because I want to make sure that it's highlighted and emphasized that this is a false belief system. This is at its very core an excuse is what it is. It sounds really good. It sounds like this is, that, that, that this is, uh, this is uh, good knowledge. This is good exercise of knowledge. I need to see it in order to believe it. Uh, many unbelievers operate in this and they use this as a reason for them only believing in science because it's observable. And uh, we could break all that apart and, and, and talk through all of that, uh, but that's gonna be for another time. And at its, but at its core, if you dug down deep enough, we would actually see that if you actually did see something, it does not always mean that you will believe in God as a result of it. It does not always mean that. So it's interesting because as we're sitting here and as we're in the worship time and we're praying and we're asking God for supernatural things to take place, there's nothing wrong with praying for the supernatural and we should be desiring those things because God has not changed. The only thing that's changed over the course of history is humankind. And even that is still a, a broken record but God has never changed. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen? So when we are in proximity to the supernatural happening, and a lot of you have been in those rooms or been around people who have had something healed, had a body part healed. They've had a mindset shift. They've had some type, like they've, they've witnessed someone being raised from the dead. You've been in proximity to that. And yet, there are days that you still doubt that God will move on your behalf. And this is that proximity effect. It's interesting to me. And I don't know fully why God's highlighting it other than for the fact to just make us aware maybe of something that's coming down the pike for our church. But if you're hearing the sound of my voice in this room or joining online, then I want you to, to, to lean in with me on, on the heart of this message. Okay, are you guys with me? I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, then this is your prompt to take notes. Uh, I want you to write this down, okay? Proximity does not equal possession. Proximity does not equal possession. One more time, proximity does not equal Possession. Let's, uh, let's read a story here. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to uh, Luke's Gospel. And in chapter 16, we read this parable that Jesus is teaching. And this is the beginning of what I'm talking about here with this statement. Proximity does not equal possession. Starting in verse 19 of Luke 16, says this. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Verse 25. 
But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. Verse 27. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you may send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said to him, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And verse 31, the hinge point of this all. But Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Proximity does not equal possession. Now write this down. Pursuit equals possession. So proximity does not equal possession but pursuit does equal possession. What I, what I mean by those two statements is this. In this parable that we just read out of Luke's gospel, this man is begging Abraham to put in front of his family a sign, put the sign in close proximity to his family in order to what? in order to bring about change, repentance, to warn them, to reveal to them, get a grip on life, wake up. It's not how you think it is. You're pursuing the wrong things. And if proximity equaled possession, then Abraham would have been totally fine with sending the sign. But because it does not equal possession, the pursuit of towards the thing is what grants you the possessing of the thing you're pursuing. Fix your eyes on the prize, so to speak. You guys going with me? This is why in scripture, this is that you see this theme throughout. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12. Colossians 3, you know, keep keep your eyes fixed on the things above, not on the things of earth below. What gets your eyes gets you and where your eyes go, you pursue. And eventually, if you talk to anyone in the secular world or anyone in the, and this is just a human truth, you can understand this. If you pursue hard enough and long enough, eventually you will possess it. And that's the truth. It really is. But, but pursuit and the pursuit of the thing is the hardest, is the hardest intangible. People don't want to move. People don't want to change. They don't want to take the necessary steps today in order to get them to the place they want to be in the future. It's the, it's the age old trouble. But pursuit eventually does equal possession. If you seek God, you will find him. Seek, I mean, draw near to God. James four, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The pursuit and you will possess. The great commission, the great commandment, Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God. It's a pursuit. I'm pursuing to love you, God. I'm pursuing to love you, neighbor. And when you pursue, you will possess. This goes, this goes hand in hand with any spiritual ambition and any earthly ambition. You can take this to the bank. Pursue, you will possess. But notice how if you are in close proximity to someone who is pursuing, it does not automatically mean that you will pursue. But we like to think that it does. This is why people are, this is why people are, in, are infatuated with celebrityism and status and, and, and being in close proximity to someone who's famous because they think that in turn that makes them famous. And it doesn't. You can have, you can have a, a, a world famous president go into a room and everyone knows who that president is. And then you could have 
uh, one of his cabinet members go into that same room and there's a very high chance that many people won't know who that person is as much as they do the president or an actor or an athlete or you name it but there's this infatuation with being close to the person it's why I mean you think of like I, I think of like the old Elvis concerts okay and people were just like if I can just get his handkerchief why like what does that do for you other than just be like incredibly weird like thank you very much there's the, the proximity infatuation deludes the reality it deludes and numbs the reality that you still have to do work too there's still a pursuit that you have to engage in. Now, that doesn't mean that by you being close proximity to someone who is pursuing, that it doesn't make things easier because it can. And thank God for that, that, uh, or that formula, that orchestration, because sometimes when you're walking really close to someone who is in a very strong pursuit, it's like how uh, when geese travel south for the winter, and they're flying in a V formation. The lead uh, goose is, is really cutting through the majority of the wind for those in the back. They're pursuing the goal. And those in the back reap the benefits of the one who is pursuing. Now, a beautiful, that's a beautiful example because what they do is no one goose is, is strong enough to travel, make that journey by themselves just like in, in a timely manner. And so they alternate those taking the turn on the lead. If you've ever seen that, if you've never seen that, you need to look that up. It's really something magical. It's just, it's just amazing that God has created them to just instinctively know that. That one, one of the goose will, will be flying for a bit and then all of a sudden will like kind of break and then another one will come and take its place and then carry the load for the team. And then break and then another one comes and then they've constantly got someone fresh at the front. And then the one goes to the back to just rest in the, the draft, basically. So you pursuing is what brings about the possession of the thing that you want. And if we are asking God, now let's, let's turn this to something that, that, that's more applicable to what we're going through right now as a church. We're asking God, we're in a, we're in a season of, of, of growth. We're in a season of, of God really, really pruning and sharpening our fellowship here. And we're asking God and, and, and believing for God to do amazing things. I love the song that we sang uh, this morning, the first song. It, it, one of my favorite uh, worship songs um, and, and, and asking God and, 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 and inviting him to come and do the miraculous in our life. Like, I, I know that you're gonna move. I believe that you can do miracles still, God. I know that you're gonna do it. And, 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 and by faith, I lay hold of that, Lord. It's the pursuit. We're pursuing these things. We want God to move. But know and understand, in our asking of God to do this, when we are praying and worshiping and, and, and calling out to him to move in some kind of capacity in our life, make sure that when he does move, that you're not caught up in the proximity of what's going on, but that you are truly found in the pursuit of what's going on. Does that make sense? Because we are all going to be, if we're all pursuing, if, if, if half of us are pursuing for God to do and move in a, in, a, in a mighty way in this church, and you just by default, by coming, show up and experience what happens, you're going to be in proximity. And in that moment, it's your decision. Do you stay as a spectator or do you jump in on the game, jump in in the field and pursue yourself and say, Lord, I want. Yes, I want. If you pursue, then it puts to death this, uh, this need for this false belief that we just read, this I need to see it in order to believe it. If you are pursuing before you see, it, will, it, it is a great antidote for this, this false belief. I need to see in order to believe. I want, I want to challenge you to, tr to, to believe before you can see. 
This is how God's kingdom is orchestrated. This is how God moves. This is how God works. I promise you, he is honored by when we believe and when we move before we see. You tap into something that is such a, a, a mighty force of grace when you move before you can see. Amen? Am I talking to anybody here? Seeing is not always believing. It does not mean that when you see it, that, okay, therefore I can believe. Now, I want to get to the heart of the message today and focus in on this incredible story that we don't read about a ton. And uh, we're going to be taking the majority of the text here today from 2 Kings. So I want you to go in your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings. And uh, we're going to be reading about Gehazi this morning. For those of you guys who have not spent a ton of time in this book, I am going to tell you there's a ton in here that's awesome. And uh, you, you'd be, you would be, it would be really good for you to spend some time in 2 Kings because there's a ton in here. But I want to take the majority of the message today to talk about this man, Gehazi, who was the servant the right-hand man, if you will, of the prophet Elisha. Now, before we dive in here, I want to give just a really quick overview of where we're going to jump in here in, in 2 Kings. And we're going to, we're going to read majority from, uh, from, from one chapter here in a second. But up in this point, Elijah has been taken up into heaven and the mantle has been passed down to Elisha, his successor. And Elisha is now moving as the man of God. You read that several times in 2 Kings as you begin to see the shift of, of God anointing uh, going from Elijah to Elisha. And so Elisha is performing miracles and Elisha is doing things that is, is I mean, truly just remarkable. I mean, performing miracles that, that uh, were, were like a, a, a foreshadowing of what Christ would do, uh, multiplying bread, uh, for a lot of you guys don't know that there, that miracle is in this book, and it's an amazing it's an amazing chapter to, to uh, a story to, to read in. But at this point, Elisha has a servant, his right hand man named Gehazi, and Gehazi is in close say proximity to Elisha, and as he's in close proximity, that means that he is eyewitnessing these miracles taking place that Elisha is performing that God is using Elisha to accomplish in, the, in, in his living. And can you, I want you to read this as we kind of dive through this and dissect this. I want you to, to read through this and understand that there is, there's a lot of miraculous things that Gehazi got to experience. That if you and I, what we would say here today is, man, if I got to see those things, then my gosh, my faith would just be like level 100. We kind of think this way, and I don't think that that's, that's great. I don't think it's good to do that. But we, we, we read about these supernatural things, and we go, man, if I could only experience that, then I would never deny him. And that's the delusion that Israel fell into. That's the same. It's, it's a human tendency is what it is. That's why to see is not always, it does not always mean belief. That's why it's a false truth. It does not mean that if you see it always, that you will believe. And that's the point of this, uh, the parable that we read in Luke 16 that Jesus spoke of. If they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, then they're not going to hear if a dead man were to rise. And it's a, it's a warning to the world, but it's also a warning to us as believers. Because we cannot get caught up in the proximity of what God is doing. We need to be caught up in the pursuit of Amen? So at this point, what we're going to read is in chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 15. And at this point in 2 Kings, Elisha has performed several miracles in the previous chapter, and we're going we're to highlight a few of them here in a second. But at this specific point, Elisha has performed so many, and Gehazi has witnessed these, same, these, these miracles. And at this specific point in time, there is a man, an army official who is high up, who, whose name is Naaman. And Naaman comes to Elisha, essentially seeking healing from his leprosy. And he's been told, Naaman has been told from his, uh, from his servant uh, girl that basically, hey, 
master, if you, I wish, I wish he, she, go, she says in the story, I wish that uh, we could find the man of God because then you could be healed. I see the agony that you're in. I see, I see what pain it's causing you. If you could just go see Elisha, then I know that God would heal you. And so then Naaman is at his wit's end and he's like, I've tried everything. I'm doing everything that I can. He has a lot at his disposal here. He's high up. He's a man of great importance. He's a man of wealth. And he says, you know, I've got to go find Elisha. So he goes in the first part of 2 Kings 5, he's, he's looking for Elisha. And then at this point in verse 15, he finds Elisha. And let's go ahead and let's just read this together. Starting in verse 15 of 2 Kings 5, says this. When he returned to the man of God with all his company, oh, and I, I should say this too. At this point, uh, Naaman finds Elisha, and then Elisha says, if you want to be healed from your leprosy, then you need to go and you need to wash yourself in the Jordan River. Now, this might be review for some of you, and maybe some of you have never really focused in on the story, so just hang with me here. But Naaman is, is really just like, uh, he's like offended that Elisha would, would make the request for him to go and bathe in such a, uh, not a pristine body of water. And he even says that in, in the story, he's like, could I not have gone and, and, and bathed in, in this body of water or this? Like they're closer, they're more grand, what, the Jordan River, really? <laughs> and then it says that he left Elisha like upset, like whatever, like I'm not doing that. And then Naaman's servant had to stop Naaman and say, listen, if like bas basically in a nutshell, what do you have to lose? Like. If, this, if God had asked you to do some other great thing, would you have done it? And yet God's asking you to do a small thing and you won't do it? Why don't we just go and do it? Like, what's the worst that could happen? And then Naaman has a change of heart. He goes and washes himself in the Jordan River and he is instantly healed from his leprosy. So now at this point now, in verse 15, this is where we pick up. And he says this, when Naaman returned to the man of God, Elisha, with all his company, and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing, Elisha said. And he urged him to take it, but Elisha refused. Naaman said, if not, please let your servant at least be given two mules, uh, two, two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant Naaman when my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the, hand, in the house of Ramon. When I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And Elisha said to him, go in peace. So he departed from Elisha some distance. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Arminian, the, the Aramian, by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw one running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? Verse 22. He said, all is well. My master has sent me saying, behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of, Ephra of Ephraim. He, uh, be pleased to take two, uh, please, excuse me, please let, uh, give them two talents of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, be pleased to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them to uh, his servants and they carried them before him. Verse 24. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and deposited them in the house. Gehazi did. And he sent the men away, and they departed. He went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to Gehazi, Where have you been? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. Uh oh. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you 
when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Is it a time to receive money and a is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes, the olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. It's an intense story. And I want to break down a few things here that took place because this is the heart of my message here today. Gehazi, don't forget, has witnessed all of these miracles that Elisha has, that God has used Elisha to perform and for all of these people. He's gotten to see it. He's gotten to be a part of it. He, he's witnessed it. And yet, even in the midst of witnessing and be, being able to stand in the midst of the widow's oil multiplying, as we read about in the previous chapter, where Elisha, there's a widow that comes to Elisha and says, I have no money. My husband has died. I have no money and I have two sons and we have debt and I don't know how we're going to live. And Elisha says, well, what do you have? And she says, well, we've got some oil. And he says, go and go and get as many jugs and bottles as you can find and have, have and bring them into your inner room and, and, and pour the oil into each bottle. And by faith she does it, and then God multiplies the oil to fill all of the bottles that they had gathered. And they had enough to be able to pay off their debt and to live off the rest. Yes, right? Gehazi witnessed uh, the Shunammites, uh, the Shunammites, Shunammite woman who blessed Elisha by building essentially a studio apartment nowadays uh, for his travels. And any time Elisha would travel back and forth from this prominent woman, this prominent, prominent Shunammite, he would stay at her house. And then Elisha says to the woman, you've taken care of us so much. This is all in chapter four, by the way. You've taken care of us so much. What can we do for you? And then Gehazi is the one that mentions to Elisha, she has no son. And then Elisha prophesies over her, next season, you're gonna have a son. And then the woman says, Lord, please don't deceive me. Please, essentially, don't, 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 don't tinker with my heart desire. It's too, it's, too, it's too unbearable. What does that tell you? They had waited a long time. They couldn't get pregnant. They had given up on it. And then all of a sudden, Elisha stands here and gives hope. And then next season, it says that she bore a son. Gehazi witnessed this. And then the story goes on that eventually as the lad grew older, he is in the field working with his father and then he falls dead. Had something to do with his head. He says, father, my head, my head. And then the son dies. And then that woman pursues Elisha and finds him. And when she finds him, she says, why? I told you not to give me a son. I told you not to because my heart couldn't bear it. Now he's gone, he's dead. What do we do? And this is an interesting part of the story that I want to lean in on because I think it tells us what went wrong with Gehazi. Because you have to ask yourself that question. What is, where was the turning point for him? How do you witness all of these things and still end up in, and end up in the position that he's in where he's choosing greed over God? How do, you, how do you get to that place? Witnessing the supernatural in the way that he was. And I think that this actually highlights it. Turn a page back to 2 Kings 4. And I want to read this together. The woman finds Elisha and Gehazi and she pleads her case and she's like, she's, she says, Elisha, my son is dead. What do we do? What do we do? And then it picks up right here in verse 29 of chapter four. It says this, then Elisha said to Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. And if anyone salutes you, do not answer him and lay my staff on the lad's face. Verse 30, the mother of the lad said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And he rose and followed her. Then Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff on the lad's face, but there was no sound or response. So he returned to meet Elisha and told him, the lad has not awakened. I think, and this is just my opinion, 
But I think that this is the turning point for Gehazi. It's not highlighted enough, but there is something that happens when God asks you to do something or when someone, a person of God, a leader, a prophet, a pastor, hears from God instruction for your life, or in this case, Elisha giving instruction to Gehazi's life. And when he goes and he says, go and do, and this will happen. Gehazi steps out in faith. He does everything exactly as Elisha told him to do it, and nothing happens. And doubt begins to creep in. And in that moment, don't you know, and this is crazy here, because there's, there is, there, we nowadays are scrutinized so heavily in the church for believing in prophecy, for believing in the supernatural, for God to do things. And because of experience and people's experience, they then start to label either the individual or the organization as something that it's not, when really there's something that, that might be bigger that God is trying to do in the midst of that situation. If you're following me here. Because what's interesting here about this, this story is this, Gehazi does exactly what Elisha tells him to do and nothing happens. Now we don't know, we don't know if Gehazi tried to do it several times or if it was a minimal effort and then he didn't know what to do after that. But after he's done the thing and nothing happens, I wanna just go, can you go with me on this? Don't you think in that moment, maybe Gehazi thought this, is Elisha a false prophet? Maybe the glory has left Elisha. Having no consideration that maybe the problem was Gehazi. And you wanna know why I know that and I'm bold in saying that? Because you go on in the next verses and what happens is Elisha hears the report that Gehazi gives to him and he then goes and does the miraculous and raises that boy to life. So it was always on God's heart to raise the boy to life. It was never not. But yet, in that moment, I think that that changed Gehazi. Whether the enemy started to whisper in his ear saying, see, you'll never be as good as Elisha. See, Elisha was the right hand to Elijah and, and, and God gave Elisha the double portion of Elijah's mantle. You know, and here you are, you're in close proximity to this man of God who's doing these miracles and the, and the nation of Israel and, and, and he's doing things that are so supernatural. This can be yours, this can be yours. Oh, here's your chance, Gehazi. Here's your chance to step out into the, st into the spotlight. Here's your opportunity to be blessed, to be anointed, to rise above. And then nothing happens. Well, maybe, maybe the time for miracles has passed. Maybe Elisha isn't truly who he says he is. Maybe Elisha heard wrong. Can you imagine the journey back to Elisha? You know he's got, he has to give this report. We read this in the matter of one, we read the, 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 the journey back to Elisha in the course of one sentence. It didn't happen and then he reports it to Elisha. But there was a journey he had to go back to Elisha. Whether Elisha was still on Mount Carmel or not, he still had to go and find Elisha to say, Elisha, the boy did not rise. But it was never, it was never different on God's heart to not raise the boy to life. It was never. It ne it, that, was the, that was what God wanted to have happen. Now, I share that story because of this. There are gonna be things that we encounter in this life, and you don't need to hear me say this, by the way, because I know that you know this. I'm highlighting it only because I think that there's something hidden here that we just need to be refreshed in. There are things that God will ask of us that we have an obligation, and hopefully we will be obedient to the calling of what he asks us. And in us being obedient to follow everything to the letter of what he says, it may not produce the result that you think it will produce. And that does not change who God is. This is, that's not a cop-out. 
because this is a very clear story showing you and proving you. It was always God's intention to heal and to raise the boy to life. And instead of Gehazi going back to Elisha and saying, Elisha, did I do something wrong? Is, there some, is my heart not in the right place? Because I did everything that you asked me to do and nothing changed. The, 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 the boy is not alive. Instead, you get this like apathetic response almost like, well, I did what you said and it didn't happen. I did what you said and it didn't happen. And I think that the difference here and another paralleling story that, that comes to mind is the story of the disciples with the epileptic boy. Where, God, where Jesus tells the disciples to go and, and tells them to cast out the spirit. And they go back to Jesus being unsuccessful, like Gehazi. But what they, the difference between the disciples and Gehazi was this. They said to Jesus, Essentially, what did, did we do anything wrong? What did we, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we do it? That question is a pursuit question. That question is a, I want to know why it didn't happen for me because I'm not compromising the truth that I know you can do it. I've witnessed to see that you can do it. I want to understand why didn't it happen? Not, well, it just didn't happen. Sorry, Jesus. And in both accounts, in Elisha and in Jesus, God delivered the spirit from the child and God raised that boy back to life. It was always his desire to do it. Do you see my point in that? The difference between proximity and pursuit is one is active and the other is passive. In proximity, if you're in proximity to what God is doing, then it is your responsibility to not just enjoy a free ride, but to jump in and to move it, continue pressing forward. Because if we get in proximity with one another, this happens, this is iron sharpening iron, this is discipleship, this is, this, all of this is, 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 is multifaceted. Because when you have people in your life who are ahead of you or who are pushing you and you're in proximity to it and you kind of catch, you, you kind of you drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and you're like, man, I, 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 I like, I want to think like that. You do it. Man, I want to I I I I have faith like that. Man, I want to pray like that. Man, I want to be as disciplined as they are. Man, I want, to, I want to be able to do that thing. I admire that. I want that. I want that. That's pursuit. That's, that's I, I've got to have that. I've got to have that. That's not, wow, isn't that so amazing that he did that? Whoa, wow. Look at you, God. Isn't that great? Man, it's not wrong to praise God. It's not wrong to, to, to be thankful for when God moves. But all of these things are not just wasted experiences that God tries to just expend to, to, to tickle your, your, your spiritual high. He wants to hopefully demonstrate these, these moves that, that we get to experience so that it pushes us into pursuing more pushes us into the pursuit rather than being, being stationed in proximity to what God is doing. Are you hearing me? It's not about being around what God is doing. It's about being in what God is and a part of what God is doing. A part, not a part, but a part of what God is doing. And when you're in proximity, the proximity is the invitation to dive in. It's lucky, it's fortunate, you're fortunate to be in the proximity, okay? It's not evil to be in the proximity, but if you do nothing with the proximity, it can become your greatest downfall, like Gehazi. Because you get so used to experiencing the supernatural, you get so used to the environment, the climate of a church, the climate or the atmosphere or the attitude of an individual, and you get so used to it that you degrade the value you degrade it because then you begin to start to see them only through the fleshly eyes versus being able to see them through the spirit. And you say, God, what are you doing here? Versus, oh man, look at what Pastor Chris just did. 
And this is, this is why this is such a detriment to our faith, because this runs prevalent in the church today. And it looks like this too. It looks like in harmless forms as, we, as well. They go, man, if I could just get my, my, my friend to come to church and hear Pastor Chris preach, then I know that they'd be saved. Versus, God, you've put them on my heart so that I can be a witness to them. That's proximity versus pursuit. And I wanna challenge you church today, if we're praying for God to move in the miraculous and to do the supernatural, then if you find yourself in the proximity, then jump in in the pursuit. It's the next step. It's the next step. If we are ever so consumed by the proximity and that we get into this, this uh, I, don't, I don't know the word for it. And the only way I know how to describe it is like how people get with celebrities. They're like, oh, I'm a part of the posse. Yeah. And we've all seen the terrible movies, the terrible movies of people who act and think that they are the stuff because they have the friend and they go up to the list and they say, hey, Michael Jordan, you can come in, but I don't, your name's not on the list. Who are you? Seeing is not always believing. Spiritual gifts and character are not one and the same. Spiritual gifts and character are not one and the same. We've been, this, this church, a lot of people from this church uh, came over from a church where there was a heavy emphasis on spiritual gifts and there was a very, there was a massive lack of teaching and discipleship on the character. And there were a lot of people that fell prey and, and got hurt very deeply that are still hurt because of this imbalance. God wants you to have spiritual gifts and, and news flash for you. They, they're not dead, they're not gone. They are still very much alive. I was, I was up here, I was up here at Kroger uh, a few months ago and I was, I was in a hurry and I was like trying to throw stuff in the back of the truck, to, uh, uh, the van to, to get back home. And this guy walks up to me and I've watched way too many crime documentaries. And he like comes up to me, I've got Jad with me. He comes up to me and he's like, hey man. And immediately I'm like in protection mode. And I'm like, I know that I, I'm like, I don't look very big, but like I'm pretty scrappy. And so I was like, I was like, okay, I don't know what's about to happen. But that's where my brain was. And, I, and if this guy ever watches this sermon and he hears this, he's, he's gonna laugh so hard because I'm giving you an, a view of like what's going on in my brain. But he comes up and he's like, hey man. And he's acting totally awkward. And that's the, that was my first sign of like, what's, what's about to happen here? I don't know what's about to happen. So Jad is like by my hip and I'm like, hey bud, why don't you go get in the van? Go ahead and get in. Because like first checkpoint is like, get my kid in something that's metal. You know, that's, okay, so he's in there and he's good. So then I'm sitting, this, sitting here with this guy and I'm talking with him. And he's like, he's kind of stuttering over his words. He's not really looking me in the eyes. And I can tell he's really nervous. And I'm like, what? I'm, I know this sounds really funny, okay? But I kind of position myself to where it's like, if I had to like throw some hands, then I'm like ready, okay? I know that sounds funny, but I was, it was a weird encounter. I didn't know what was about to happen. So I'm sitting here and I'm kind of like this. And, uh, and he's like, so man, uh, can I pray for you? And immediately I was like, oh gosh, okay, it's just one of you. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right. All right, I, I, all right, I got it now, I got it now, I got it. And uh, he starts going, he starts, he's like, can I, he's like, I, I wanna pray for you. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, I'd love that. You know, I'd love that. And I told him I was a pastor and we prayed and everything. And we get to the very end of the prayer and he, and he, was, he was just being, he was trying to do things that, were calling, that was challenging his faith to step out and do, and to go pray for someone he didn't know, okay? And I applaud that, okay? So anyways, at the very end of the conversation, he says to me, he's like, he's like, man, dude, Acts 2, Acts 4, the spiritual gifts, they're coming back. And I looked at him, and, I, and this was my genuine response. I looked at him and I said, I said, man, they never went anywhere. Yeah. And when I said that to him, he went, wow, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's to our detriment that we preach this, that it's like, this is God's homecoming. 
Oh, here he comes again. Don't miss it. He never went anywhere. He never changed anything. What changed is you got more distracted. What changed is you, you have underemphasized the tools that you've been get granted. What's changed is the, the tactics and the schemes of the enemy have never changed. They're the same thing, but with a different hairdo. And they've got our society. And so when we pray for God to move in the miraculous, and, and, and when we desire spiritual gifts, please know this, we, we, we believe wholeheartedly here that that has never changed and that it should be an active part of your daily living. And, and uh, just, a, just a, a, a side note here, that it should always be done with decency and order. Colossians, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, is, Paul is very specific about this. But in the pursuit of spiritual gifts, as we're asking God to do things that go beyond our natural abilities, we have got to understand that character cannot be thrown to the back seat. You have to have character in order to be able to be effective in the spiritual gifts that God has given to you. I brought a sermon a few years ago and it's come back to mind here today, but it's, it's like building a fire. If the fire and, the, and the, the wood and the flame and everything is like the spiritual gifts or the encounter, the supernatural, then the thing that keeps that fire from consuming the entire land is the rock border that, that, that defines where that fire exists. And those rocks are the character that we are supposed to have in our life so that we're not just burning people alive, but so that they can come to a place and find shelter and find warmth next to the fire. That is what character does to spiritual gifts. It gives you the ability to, it gives God the ability to shine through you and not puff you up, but instead exalt him. So spiritual gifts and character are not one and the same and they should be. And I think that this is maybe where Gehazi really began to get sideways because he thought that by him being in close proximity to these miracles and he's seeing these things, he's thinking, man, how special am I? And then the enemy was just building him up to de- for his downfall. And then he goes and he gets his opportunity as Elisha sends him and then nothing happens. And then he begins, to down, and he begins down this downward spiral to the point to where he forfeits everything that he has witnessed up to that point to be able to say, you know what? Now I want the, I want the money. I don't know why Elisha turned the gift away, but now I'm gonna go make up this phony story about some two, two sons that need a, a car payment, that need to be able to feed their family, and they need, two, they need you know, two new outfits and everything. Where did that story come from? It came from his deception. And then he's before Elisha, and then Elisha says, we read it, where'd you go? Oh, I didn't go anywhere. That was, that was, that was the second mistake. I don't know, I don't know what in the world, he was, he was so blinded by that point. And then Elisha makes a very curious statement. He says, did my heart not go with you? Whew, that's sobering. You forget that everywhere you go, God goes. Everywhere you go. What you put in front of your eyes, God sees. What you put in fr- into your heart, God knows. When no one's watching, God's watching. What you do in the secret place, God sees. And Jesus says, he will reward you for what you do in the secret place. Focus in on the pursuit of what God is trying to do in your life. Don't be caught in the proximity and don't buy into the lie that says, I have to see it in order to believe it. Because Jesus says this, this is one of my all time favorite passages in all of scripture. John 20, 29. If you don't have this highlighted in your Bibles, you need to turn to your Bibles and you need to highlight this. John 20, verse 29 says this, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Consider the words of Jesus here. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. If we wanna see God move in miraculous ways, then let's not be shocked if when he asks us to step out and to do something in faith, if it doesn't turn out the way that we think it should have or thought it should have, does that affect your belief in it? If it does, I wanna challenge you on that. I think that there's more to it than that. 
And hopefully through the stories that we've read here today, you can see that. And I hope that it beckons you into a pursuit of greater things in your life. And I don't want you to stay on the sideline. I want you to dive in. I want us to go deeper. I know that God is still moving today. I believe that he still uses the supernatural to, to, uh, to interact in our, in our present day. It's not something that's brand new for him. It's who he has always been. I, I don't know how the rest of this service is gonna transpire. I know that we said we wanted to have some prayer and uh, I wanna use this as an invitation for you. Wherever you're at, wherever you're at in your faith walk, if you've been believing for some things and you've not seen them yet, guess what that means? It means that the story's still not over. It means that the story is still not finished. There's still more that could, that could happen. Never, ever stop believing. He can do it. The things that we are so quick to cast aside we define them by our own human experiences rather than in faith in God. And we allow our experience to dictate God versus God to, experience, to dictate our experience. And it's, we get it so backwards. But guys, I, I want us to, I want to see God do things, yes. But at the same time, if I, even if I never see them, my faith my faith is not going to be impacted by that because I know, it, I know that it's, it's who he is. I am firm in belief that it's who he is. And if he hasn't done it yet, or if I never get to see it, I cannot let that dictate or define him. Proximity does not equal possession. Pursuit equals possession. Will you stand with me? Dad, I'll, I want to turn this over to you, you know, here in a second. But what I want to do before we move into this prayer time and before we get some further direction here, I want to pray for every person here. And then I want to invite you to participate and to pursue into whatever it is that we're going to, the, the direction we're going to go from here. Okay. If you feel comfortable to do this, whether you're here in this room or you're watching online, I want you to do this. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to reach or, or extend your hands in a way as a form of surrender. And this is, this is going back to last week's message from Pastor Brittany, awesome message, a statement of surrender. What we fail to realize is that in our pursuit of God, when we actually begin to pursue him, we realize that we were being pursued the entire time. And so when we surrender, we go, whoa, you were chasing me all along. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Seek the Lord and he will let you find him. Call out to him and he will answer. Believe in him, ask in faith and it will be done for you. Father, I pray right now for the people who have heard your words here today, that it would inspire them into faith, not into doubt, Father, but they would look at the situations, they would look at the experiences, they would look at where they have come from, where they've been, the thing they're currently in the middle of, and if they have any type of direction that they've been given, whether it be by you through personal encounter in their quiet times, or through pursuit from them going to a pastor or a leader or, or someone who they they have in their life that speaks into their life and that has given them some type of direction or, or, or trajectory or attitude, some type of attitude or, or, or angle for them to be able to walk in. If they've been faithful to walk in and they're not seeing anything just yet, then this is for them, this is for you. I pray, Lord, that you would give them grace to keep going, that they would be persistent on not forfeiting their faith just because they haven't seen it yet, that they would be willing to pursue you to greater measures like the disciples did, to ask the questions so that they can be discipled and disciplined into greater measures and levels of faith so that they could 
could go to and witness and be a part of and participate with your Holy Spirit's activity in the world today to see the miraculous happen. I thank you, God, because you have never changed. You are still the same. It's our faith that has to become active. It's our faith that has to go to a new level. And when we are in the room and you move, whenever that time is, whether when we see a friend get healed or a friend or a family member be provided for or some type of situation that gets worked out and we go, how in the world did that happen? When we're in the proximity of a miracle, let it drive us into the pursuit. Let, us, let it pull us in, Father, and may we not get caught in the deception that the enemy loves to try to torment and tempt us with that says this, well, it happened for them, but it will never happen for you. It happened for them, but it'll never happen for you. Well, it happened for them, but that was because it was supposed to happen for them. But now God doesn't move that way anymore. I want to witness to you here today, church, anyone who's hearing the sound of my voice, God is still the same. He's not changed. And the sooner that you believe that, the sooner that you engage with that, you're going to begin to see evidence of it. I'm living testimony of it. And I'm telling you, when you pursue, He's found. I'm telling you, when you pursue, He is found. Amen. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for all that you're doing in this church. Father, I pray that you would now come in these next moments as we now pursue, come and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.